Well, well, Port ISD, and thank you for being here. It is now 7.07 .07 p.m. April 9, 2024, and I hereby call this meeting to order. Notice of this meeting has been posted in a manner required by law. The Board of Trustees of the LaPorte Independent School District are now convened. Tonight, Trustee Thompson will not be in attendance with us tonight. However, let the record show the remaining six trustees are in attendance and a quorum is present. As LaPorte ISD Board of Trustees, every student's success is our number one priority. We are here to set goals, adopt policy, approve budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and communicate the district's vision and success to the community. It is not the role of the board to make day-to-day -day operational decisions. The management and day-to-day -day operations of the district are the responsibility of the superintendent. This is a public meeting of the Board of Trustees, not a meeting of the public. School board meetings are open to all who wish to participate and attend uh, the matters and discuss the matters. Uh, however, audience participation is limited to the uh, patron presentation portion of the meeting. The Board of Trustees may not respond to those comments made in the public comment section. These proceedings may be recorded and I respectfully ask that you please refrain from talking when others are speaking. Before I begin, I wish to sincerely thank you for taking your time to join us tonight and for your interest in Laporte ISD. At this time, will you please stand for the presentation of colors led by the Laporte High School ROTC. Tonight, right guard is Cadet Sergeant Danica Himes. American flag, Private First Class Shelby Martinez. The Texas flag, Cadet Private First Class Isabel Grant. Left Guard Cadet Private David Kemp. Do you want me to pledge allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state Here's the invocation by Trustee Miss Melissa Crutcher. If you would, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight in service of the Port ISD. You have blessed us with amazing students to learn, teachers, staff, and administrators to oversee the education, growth, and well-being of your children. And we are grateful every day for these blessings and ask that you continue to guide us as we make decisions for the good of them all. Lord, we, Lord, as our students and teachers start testing season, we ask that you fill them with peace and confidence in their progress. We are so proud of the hard work that they have put in this year. And while we know that everyone's success looks different, we are confident that they will all do great. And Father, finally, we also ask that you look over the family of former teacher, school librarian, and longtime LPHS theater volunteer, Ms. Walding Lundquist, who passed away earlier this week. Today, on what would have been her 80th birthday, we celebrate yet another gift you gave LPISD, and we know her legacy will live on in your it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll now move to item five, board recognitions. Tonight's recognitions will be presented by Director of Communications, Mr. Adam Holland. Good evening, guests. Uh, first, uh, uh, just a little housekeeping. We, because there's such a log jam that, that, that can happen in situations like these, we've asked the students, once their performance is complete, to exit uh, the door on this side of the room. We ask that you do the same. You, you've seen all the people out there. They will then be able to come in, and we do appreciate your cooperation. And now, College Park Elementary Choir, under the direction of Rachel Sam, has a musical treat for us. Good evening, 
everyone. So we have some of our second graders with us tonight. So our second graders from College Park, they just finished performing last week their spring musical called EIEI -E Oops. Um, so uh, just to set up the story for you, we're going to sing the last song from our musical. Our story takes place at Old McDonald's Farm. Everything is going so well except for one problem. Our cow won't move. Everyone is worried. The crazy pigs try to help by telling some jokes. They like to ham it up. Madam Cow likes the jokes, but she still won't move. Little Bo Peep and her sheep would like to help, but they just keep getting lost. Finally, the chicks, who are not only very cute, but very smart, suggest we ask the wise old mule what to do. The wise old mule says the problem with this cow is clear. She doesn't feel part of the team. What's obvious with this cow is fear and a lack of self-esteem. Oh. So everyone begins to compliment Madam Cow and encourage her to moo by mooing along with her. Come on, everybody. Let's move. Moo. Everybody look at the guy in the middle. 
Let's give it up again for College Park second graders. And if parents remind you again, if we could exit out this way so that we can have some of our other honorees come in this way, greatly appreciate it. Good job. Good job. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on in our recognitions this evening, Rodeo Art winner. Students from LaPorte High School, LaPorte Junior High School, and Leo A. Rizzuto Elementary Schools earned Best of Show awards for their respective age categories in the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo Art Show. Artists from LaPorte High School, LaPorte Junior High, and Jenny Reed are represented in the gold medal category. LaPorte High School was additionally recognized with a special merit ribbon. Best of Show. Peyton Griggs, LaPorte High School. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Peyton Griggs, LaPorte High School. Rhea Miller, LaPorte Junior High School. Colton Stout, Rizzuto Elementary School. Now we're going to move on to our gold medalists. Claire Underwood, LaPorte High School. Elena Ramakasun, LaPorte Junior High School. April Rignac, Jenny Reed Elementary School. And finally, with a special merit award, Nicole Haywood, LaPorte High School. Ladies and gentlemen, as people are filing in, we will move to our next recognition this evening because I saw him enter the room, Benjamin Tercero. Benjamin, come on up. All right, here's a little bit about Benjamin Tercero. On February 24th, he took 12th overall in the 100-meter breaststroke at the UIL State Swim and Dive Meet in Austin. He qualified for state by um, uh, doing really well at the regional championships. He set two LaPorte High School records. And just last week, he was named All-State Swimming. Congratulations, sir. Congratulations. Our next recognition this evening, Rakea Sudin. Are you here? There you are. Okay. 
Rakea is a junior and she represented LaPorte High School on March 16th at the Texas High School Women's Powerlifting Association's state meet where she finished 14th. She also previously won the Region 4 Championship at Alvin High School and with her win she became the first ever female regional champion in LaPorte High School history and joins Delisa Promise back in 2018 as the only female lifters to ever qualify for THS WPA State Championships. Congratulations. <laughs> We have another state qualifier and state qualifiers. This is a group, LaPorte High School bowling team. Front and center, please. There they are. The LaPorte High School varsity bowling team wrapped up the 23-24 season by finishing 16th in the state of Texas high school state bowling tournament in Fort Worth. That deserves a huge hand. Meanwhile, Austin gets this gentleman holding the frame, and I found out he's just a junior, so he's going to be with us again next year. He finished eighth in the state in singles competition. This guy can roll. I'm going to give you the names of these bowlers real quickly, and we do have certificates for you guys. Major Horn, let us know who you are. Austin. Austin gets right there in the middle. Leland Tran. Marshall Horn. Ethan Martinez. And Raymond Gibbs. Congratulations, y'all. Way to go. That's nice. Way to go, Bulldog Bowlers. Okay, I think I see some lady dogs basketball players up against the back wall. Y'all come on up. While you're on the way, once again, the Lady Dogs basketball team won the by district championship and qualified for the UIL area playoffs this year. And I'm going to read the names if you guys want to go on over there. We are extremely proud of Coach Alicia Thompson and all the student athletes, managers, trainers, everyone involved in the Lady Dogs basketball program, and we congratulate them on another outstanding season. Now let's make our way through the roster. If you guys will, um, if you ladies will raise your hand when I call your name, we have a certificate for you. Kaya Greenewalt. Michaela Parker. Bella Spears. There we go. Addison Parker. Skylin Kiever. Sarah Green. Shanora Brodnax. Esme Soto. Jaquela Glover. Angelina Goins. Sophia Rodriguez. Kinley Arachiga. Arachiga. <laughs> Kaylin Maracle. We would also want we also want to recognize varsity assistant coach Consuela Lindsay. Where are you, coach? And of course, once again, head coach and athletic director Alicia Thompson. Y'all come on up and get in the photo.
Oh, by the way, are the managers and trainers here? Okay, sorry, Chloe Stone. Not here. <laughs> Brianna Moore. <laughs> Ayla Ruffin. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your report, Lady Dog. Ladies and gentlemen, our Bulldogs basketball team under new head coach Anthony Stevens also deserves kudos as they too advanced to the bi-district playoffs. The Bulldogs were 6-6 uh, six and six in district play with an overall 20-16 and 16 record. Congratulations, Bulldogs. Now, let's go through the roster. Caden Watson. Mason Bell. Trent Kellys, Anthony Cole, Kinte Winrow, Philip Goins, Matthew Williams, Philip Ned, Gian Guardiola. Logan Prey, Jaden Martinez, Cody Miller, Chase Harmon, and Zayden Hitt. We would also like to recognize varsity assistant coach Houston Posey. Photo time. Congratulations, Bulldogs. That completes our recognitions for this evening. Good evening. Now we have some of our business partner recognitions. And we're going to start with Carare America. Carare continually supports Laporte ISD in a variety of, way, of ways. Carare annually supports the Laporte Education Foundation through its partner program. And Carare Representative Vance Dar serves on the Foundation Board of Directors. Carare America Poval was also one of the sponsors for the Laporte ISD Elementary and Secondary Teachers of the Year program this year. And the company is also sponsoring our summer reading program in 2024. We're very appreciative of the company's support and involvement, and we have LaJasmine Fitch, who's the recruiting su supervisor, here to accept this recognition. Thank you, LaJasmine. We also have Intercontinental Terminals Company here with us tonight. Intercontinental Terminals demonstrates its commitment to Laporte ISD through volunteerism and support of various activities. They are an annual supporter of the Laporte Education Foundation's partner program, and they've also sponsored the 30th Anniversary Gala, Breakfast with the Stars, the annual golf tournament, and Hoops Classic. In addition, the company sponsored the March 2nd Laporte ISD Robotics Galactic Rumble BattleBots Tournament with eight representatives from Intercontinental Terminals Company volunteering their time as judges. 
Service. Employees also recently judged the Lomax Junior High Science Fair. We're very grateful to Intercontinental Terminals for the company's continued support. And tonight we have Jessica Ventura, Miguel Escoto, and Carl Holly. Thank you. Carl, we can take the picture if you want. No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. We will now move to item six, public comment. The board will now hear those who wish to make comment and who have completed and returned the public comment participation request. This section will be conducted in accordance to the Texas Open Meetings Act and board policy. Complaints and concerns for which other resolution channels are provided shall be directed through those channels. Mr. Shoppe? You have any? All right, please note for the record that uh, there are no speakers. So we will move to item seven, the administrative reports. Dr. Jackson. Yes, board, you have a copy of my uh, report, and just for the sake of time tonight, I'll just ask that you peruse that at your own time, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that fast, okay? Yes, sir. So with that said, we'll move to B, and here our uh, CFO, our business take a moment to go through our fiscal year 2025 budget where we are right now in that in that process uh, we discussed this a, a few board meetings ago so some of this might look familiar to you so in January we calculated our campus and department all, uh, allotments and we set up our, our meetings for training so when we when we created the allotments we added inflation for utilities fuel our SRO costs and also for our, our property and all the different types of insurances because that all increased. So we, we put in a inflation uh, ratio to, to account for that. In February we met with our budget managers uh, and discussed next year budget, anything they needed to have questions on or, or how to how it actually entered in. Um, they all did a great job and so they entered them. So then in March we met with y'all on March 19th for our very first budget workshop for this year for fiscal year 2025 and uh, we also reviewed our enrollment trends and our staffing needs and then I have been working on our revenues our expenditures any kind of fund balance projections it's it's very uh, early in the process in March because we don't have everything we need yet and so it's it's a shot in the dark but it, it's all estimates at that point so then we moved to, to April we uh, are completing our staff meetings with our campuses, and that's been going very well. Um, really, it's, it's, it's very helpful for us, but I think it's also very helpful for the campuses uh, to really kind of understand how, how everything is, is working. Um, then we have on April 8th, we will, is our last day for all budget managers, meaning for the campuses and all departments, to enter in any kind of uh, uh, encumbrances for expenditures that they expect to have for this point until June 30th and that allows us to calculate kind of what the estimate is so they encumber everything that they, cost, that they think they're going to have and and then their spending is pretty much stopped and then we have time to figure out okay what is the actual impact to our fund balance how much expenditures do we truly have we'll do payroll uh, reviews too and uh, projections of 
this is how this is how much we expect for each payroll to be for the remaining of the year, and uh, come up with a much better estimate of what our true expenditures are going to be at the end of fiscal year 2024. And then on April 29th, we expect to receive, or we have to receive, some some counties are already getting it, but uh, we will receive our, our certified estimates of our taxable property value. And so we use that to calculate what our tax revenue and then also what our recapture is going to be uh, estimated to be for fiscal year 2025. So in May, we are planning on having our workshop shop number two. Um, the date is, is tentative. We'll, we'll work with the board, obviously, to, to find a date that, that is suitable for you. But we'll, also, we'll discuss compensation and then also um, the budget during that workshop. I will also post our notice uh, that's a requirement of our budget adoption for our June board meeting. And we'll be working to prepare the budget workbook that we give to you at that June meeting. And then in June, we will have, on the 11th, we'll have our, um, our proposed budget and uh, budget adoption and then June 30th is our last day of the fiscal year. So that's kind of a wrap up of, of what is coming up for y'all and for us. These are some of the topics that we plan to, to discuss at the May budget workshop and please if there's anything else that you would like us to, to go over if you would uh, email me and we will definitely make sure that, that it's covered in that, that workshop. So we're going to be talking about our estimated revenues and recapture amounts, our tax rate options, uh, also, our estimated uh, 24 ending balance and what we think our fund balance might be at that point. Any kind of our average daily attendance, the trends that we've had in the previous years and what we are projecting for the future. Uh, property valuation changes from and what we project in the future. Uh, a preliminary 2025 budget overview and then also discuss any kind of additional staffing that um, we need to consider so we know that there's going to be a need in special education and so that's something that we'll, we'll definitely be bringing to the table and then um, any changes to our compensation plan will will be a preliminary discussion with y'all and then that will give you time to answer any, you know have any questions answered and, and prepare us for the june board meeting so right now our estimated, this is with our estimated fiscal year 25 expenditures, so this does not include any kind of re recapture payment that we would have to make, but we, we've allocated about $2 million to our campuses, our departments is $20 million. Um, that might seem, you know, high for, for the departments and low for the campuses, but we're talking every department, and that includes our insurance, and that includes our SROs, and our transportation, and our maintenance, and so it's not, um, it's, it's every department. Um, athletics, fine arts, everything. So our payroll budget for the current year for 2024 is 71 million. So I left that in there right now because no decisions have been made. And then we know that, that this year, 3 million uh, expenditures are gonna be added to. So that leaves us with a total of, of right now, a total of estimated uh, without recapture of 96 million. And last year, um, the amount would be about 91 million. And so the difference between that is that is sort of, and then also inflationary that's happening. Are there any questions that I can answer for you? We don't include the uh, recapture. Why don't we at this point? Because I, I won't be able to tell you what that is until April, at the end of the month, when they give us our certified. That's when we'll. I'll be able to calculate what we think. Yes, sir. May not be part of this portion, but do we go out for bid on our energy? I know whenever we go to some of these conferences, they have an energy pool or something. <laughs> do we go out for bid on that? We, we do not go out to bid for energy. Why? What well, it's the, I'm sorry? We, we recently did uh, under the cost of what's for energy for shell energy, the electricity. When was that? Yeah, so we're still on a contract for another year under them, so we'll go back out next year. But uh, they did go out to bid for that uh, okay. before our time here. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So yes. Next year. Sounds like it. Thanks. Any other Thanks. questions? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now go to item C. For bond and safety update, Dr. Brahman. Yes. 
says, well, you know, <laughs> good evening. <laughs> I don't want to mess with it. I'll turn, I'll turn off when I do get here. <laughs> Good evening, President Hanks, Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Jackson, tonight to provide you your April update as it pertains to bond and safety in the district. A um, lot going on at Bulldog Stadium and Development Center. Uh, it's uh, starting to really take shape. Help me. Really take shape out there. And um, as early as this uh, last week, we um, started to see some of the raker beams and some of the bleacher installation uh, start. So you, you, if you're out there, you can see that and how that's starting to form. The entire low, lower bowl, or the lower half of the stadium on the home side is complete as far as the raker beam system, and they started today in the upper uh, level of the stadium. Um, so you can kind of see that, and they move very fast with that. Um, that'll be a part of the underneath piece, and then they'll come through and they'll start to apply the, the bleacher system that goes on top of it. Uh, and a majority of what we've got on the home side, obviously, is the bucket seats, and I'll kind of show you that here in a second. This gives you an example. It's kind of hard to, to look at it, uh, but if you look at the second page in your packet, you'll kind of see how it connects to those raker beams and how they're set up. So it pretty much lips off of that. You'll sit there, you'll have your foot space uh, in the very front of the, the concrete wall, which will eventually be uh, faced with brick. There is a, a, a railing system that's there, obviously, for some, so you don't fall over and whatnot. But it's set up good. It, it's obviously uh, built for great viewing. Uh, sites and sight lines and, and whatnot as far as track meets and football and all the things that we do in there So that's just a good example that you can kind of look at and kind of compare what it what it looks like as far as that record beam And how those bleacher systems will work is is the foot space a little bit more than what's at the Bulldog Center? It is okay. actually um, Especially for the uh, bucket seats because instead of being down on the ground where they're in the ground They're on the back side of that so when you look at the as that raker goes up and the, the angle that's vertical it'll be attached to that and then when the seat backs up, there's there's extra room. It's about 30 inches, give or take. So trying to paint a picture. Um, in the left-hand corner, you'll see kind of the you know design images that we've shown you over time, and then it's kind of starting again to come together. This is just an aerial view, and I threw some color on it just to kind of give you some perspective, of, you know, in comparison to what that image looks like. Obviously, the top deck, um, that's the viewing deck for the band that we've talked about, the judging deck. Um, and then to the right and the left of that, that's all our coaches and our media and those different areas for uh, the announcers and whatnot. Uh, they're at that level. When you move to that second level, that's the suite level. Uh, that, that houses the different suite components in it. Uh, and then there's also an exit from that suite level, actually the whole entire press box component down into the stand. So just again, to give you an idea of what it looks like, and you can see the picture that we use all the time that we see uh, just starting, starting to take shape. Home side, they're putting up the stairs system as well, uh, and also starting the blocks uh, on, the, on that press box side. You're starting to see some of that. That'll continue. They'll start on the visitor side soon as well. Eventually, that will be bricked. Uh, again, that brick will, will coincide with what's at the Bulldog Center and, and the rest of the different items throughout that village aspect that we've talked so much about. I kind of gave you a picture again from our different graphics to kind of show you what that is starting to look like um, as far as the brick component and what, what that is showing. The stairs are again coming in as we speak. They're start, that was from today. Uh, so that whole system will be put in uh, on home side and we'll move over to the visitor side. There's been a lot of concrete work. Uh, they're, they're literally laying concrete all day long, every day uh, to get things in place, whether it be foundations or our entryways into the facility. Visitor side, same thing. They're moving around and they still got some concourse to lay over there. And then you'll see that raker beam and that bleacher system wrap around into the bowl and into the visitor side. And you can see we poured concrete in the back. That's for our fire lane uh, to be fire code and be approved. Uh, so if the fire apparatus can get in there and do what they need to do as it relates. And also that'll be a travel point for our kids um, when, the, when they move throughout uh, the day in that, that, that area. The bowl, I just wanted to point out um, We've got two visitor locker rooms over there and they're kind of starting to take shape. That's kind of why I pinpointed this, but just to give you perspective, that aerial view, uh, they're continuing, they're kind of roughing those out, but they're really starting to define a little bit more. Uh, just to, to, to recall that we've got both of those visitor locker rooms. So when we come in and when we rent it or when we play uh, people, they never actually go into our facility at the development center. So they'll be using that uh, and they'll be exiting out of those, those points in the stadium. So again, just to, Give you some perspective. Development center is taking off. They'll actually be they'll, they'll be going vertical. Hopefully this week, depending on rain and, and some of that, but uh, no later than next week. So you'll start to see some of that steel go up. Um, we poured all the concrete there in the entryway. You can see some of that some of that additional parking that we've discussed uh, through different various updates. 
uh, again, just kind of giving you perspective there. Um, we're excited about the field house getting going because I think once you start seeing that be vertical, it's just really going to kind of tell the story and show you what that all looks like. Moving on, any questions on uh, Bulldog Stadium? Since you brought up the uh, field house, um, the existing field house, we're going to keep that until this one is completely very end. That's constructed. right, and then it will go away, and then that will become parking. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Part that. of that, why that I'm so sorry. Part of why that uh, building is still left over there. There's power running into that. Once we get our new power, that will come down and we'll start that process. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, I'm way jumping ahead, but like a rental agreement. So will we keep the the current agreement we have, the current Bulldog Stadium, or are we going to revise that or totally revise the whole thing? So we'll look at it. Yeah, y'all say it. Absolutely. And you know, I'll have some conversations yeah. about what we want to try to do to get that process. We'll be totally relooking at all our uh, processes. Also. Speaking of contracts, have we did the agreement we signed with Barbara Stell was that a two-year contract, or do we need we have to renew that again? So we're gonna have to revisit that soon. Yeah, but we have a plan for that because our first three or four games are away games, and so what we're planning to do is have a plan to where we won't play in Barbara Stell, but we, if we have to, we will play those games at Deer Park and not have to go. Okay. Sorry, one more question. Um, and I'm sure I can look back at a previous pictures, but I didn't remember seeing it this way, so I just want to ask the the seats that are like the stadium seating, not the stadium, but the the actual chairs. Yes. Okay. That's the whole home side, and then it's bleacher seats on the other side. Is that what you're saying? So if right here. Um, We've extended heavily, so a majority of the home base side is kind of hard to say. But it's not, it's, it is not the entire. Okay. No, there's. You can see there's one section to the right up there in that right corner, that is the bleacher seating. Okay. And then that the rest is bleacher seating. And that's open to anyone. It's so not we'll reserved seating. We'll have to go back and revisit that process. Most of the tickets are still seated the reserved seating, but yeah. that's why I'm saying we're going to have to have some conversation. Well, I I only ask because yeah. um, I have family members and right. my, you know myself my husband we're, we're big people we were you know like this is the thing yeah, like for us you know so making sure accommodating all all body types and sizes and stuff so right. that was just i wanted to make sure we had you know seating available for yeah, everyone we, we extended that heavily uh, i don't know the number but i know we are largely over what we had in our former stadium uh and i know we've already talked about grandfathering different groups and trying to figure out if you had those you get yeah so there'll be a complete process on along the lines of uh, and, and we, my plan is to find the right consultant to come in and kind of help us get our goal and have to do that so that there's no to take the emotion out of that correct because if you've been a season ticket holder for you know 40 years we want to make sure we honor that but we also want to be comfortable for three dollars <laughs> a ticket you know they're going to win a brand new mm -hmm. <laughs> that's correct Thank you. Okay. All right, shift it over to uh, Lomax Junior High School project. Uh, we're, we're off and running on that. I think it kind of gives some small updates, but today I hopefully can give you some better timeline as, as we're setting. We're currently in schematic design, so just, and I'll put some items there. So we're in the initial concept phase. We're just trying to wrap up to see what it looks like. Uh, you know, what does that program outline? Where does it set on the, uh, the land? What does all those things hit? We'll be moving at the end of this month into design development. That's where we get more in tune, more developed, more detailed as far as what does this door look like? What is this programmed exactly for? So we're not quite there, but I do have some images for you tonight. Uh, that'll run us till really the end of the semester into the summer, and then we'll move into the construction document phase. And what we're doing there is we're so detailed at that point, we're ready for that dollar amount to be attached to that and then that will go out for bid right so we're hopeful uh, to get all that done in, in October and then start construction at Lomax in November as it relates to the competition gym because it will be freestanding so it will not affect the kids the renovation part we'll have we're going to work through and try to get that timeline with it but that just gives you an overarching idea I kind of showed this to you before this is a little bit more defined since you last saw it um, part of the conversation uh, for the architect is to look at building this, but also ensuring that down the line, 10, 50, whatever, down the line, if we wanted to come back and put a replacement building there, if we had growth and we wanted to make a new junior high school, we would have the ability to do that. We're not planning that, but the way the competition gym will set, it's in the idea that you could do that, right? You're not blocking yourself. You're not attaching it to the current structure, and then it causes problems. So that's what you're seeing there right now. That is where the planned uh, 
plot of, of the competition gym will be. Uh, it will be covered. People can walk to it, all that, that connection. But that is uh, the, the layout. You can see, obviously, the entry point of Lomax being here. So when we talk about the, the actual renovation part, so what it is, and you've been to Little Max, so we've got the auxiliary gym and then the competition gym. We'll be going into the current auxiliary gym and renovating that space uh, for, for fine arts, removing, uh, excuse me, installing offices and obviously space for, for those different groups. So it's trying to, to wrap that up and get that outline. This is just a general idea. We'll go into the current competition gym, remove the bleachers, uh, and, and finish the floor and then there'll be painting throughout the facility. So an entire upgrade as it relates to that. Shift to the competition gym. What you see at LPJ, very similar, if not almost the same, right? So seating for 700 spectators, it is a competition gym. It'll have coaches' offices in it. It'll have locker rooms for athletics and locker room for PE. So that's what that is looking like as we, as we are in the schematic phase. We'll obviously shift and, and move into more permanent things, and you'll see what that looks like. But that's kind so of that's going to be where the main locker rooms are going to be at? So the boys will still currently. Yeah. It'll be programmed unisex, so it can be used anyway. But with our model as we sit here, the boys would stay in the athletic park because they have their own wing there, and then the girls would move to the outside. Okay. Any uh, questions on Lomax? Yep. Yes, sir. So on the fine arts, I guess that's the west part of the building, the fine arts where they are now, are we doing anything over there because there's a flooding, right? Correct. There's some foundation issues. That'll be a part of the plan, too. We're trying to look at dollar figures and what we can do, maybe a large group space, looking at art, some of the other things on what we can change there as well. So that is a part of the So we don't know what we're going to put there because we're moving all the fine arts to the other side of the building. Correct. Right? Okay. That's great. Kind of a silly question, but I think it begs asking this because, like, the last time we renovated Field House, we had an issue with uh, not enough uh, restrooms for our female athletes. Is that completely well, off the table? I'll live through that with you. I remember. <laughs> no, it will not be a concern. That's right. Cool. Thank you. And all of them will be built for both boy and girl and have the appropriate needs. All right, moving on to safety just real quick, and this is a, a positive. Uh, we received this last week um, our safe grant cycle. I kind of mentioned this uh, briefly. We were waiting to hear from us, and, and the district will receive $252,000. Uh, that is huge, yes, um, because the blessing is we're in compliance with all the requirements, so we can use these things, hopeful, uh, looking into using for offsetting SRO costs and security costs that hit us in that general fund. Uh, so that's a big deal for us. Okay. I do have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. The gym at the high school, yeah. that is disgusting. When, it, when are we going to work on that? Yes, that's starting. We're, we're starting that process. I'm hoping in May to give you a little bit of a timeline on that. We're trying to work those budgets together because uh, we allotted a, a large amount and we're trying to break those apart. So, so would it be, I, oh. so do we think if we're trying to get it done where it'll start for the new school year? I or? don't have a timeline. Okay. Yeah, I can yeah. tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be the last piece. And yeah. then last part. The signs that we talked about on the Bulldog Centre or Center yep. that I know how to say it, I just don't like the way it's spelled. The if you're walking up to it, we talked about this before, there's no signage. Obviously, for the normal person, you can see how to get into the building, yep. but some of the people who aren't from here, it would be so simple. I'm sure we have a sign that we can make this or go to Copeland's and just put a sign that says entrance to the right, handicap in here. Yeah, because uh, it's very confusing. A uh, part of the stadium will be complete. We will have fun. Redo of wayfinding. We've talked about street naming. Uh, Doc has already talked about putting the names no. of the buildings, or excuse me, yeah, the name of the on the building. So yes, that, all that will be. I'm talking about like within the next three weeks, getting a sign. So for the, all the sports that are going in for the let people incoming, know where it is. Yeah. let people know where it is. Yep. I mean, you can, I can get a drill and put the sign up there. No, we can do that. Yeah, I mean, obviously I wouldn't oh, do it, but I mean, very soon. Any questions on this? No, oh, sir. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Board, if uh, there are no objections, we are going to skip ahead and take an item out of order. And I would like to go down to item 11. We've got some guests that um, would be affected if we can go down to item 11, the consent agenda, and uh, take care of that. Any objections? What's the item? Item 11. Oh. There's the consent agenda. We're going to do consent agenda. All right. All right. A. Determine and approve any consent agenda items. B. Approve board meeting minutes. One. Regular board meeting minutes, March 5th, 2024. 
two special board workshop meeting minutes, March 19th, 2024. Received principal's report, early childhood center, two Bayshore Elementary, three College Park Elementary, four Heritage Elementary, five Jenny Reed Elementary, six Laporte Elementary, seven Rizzuto Elementary, eight Lomax Elementary, nine Baker sixth grade campus, 10 Laporte Junior High, 11 Lomax Junior High, 12 Laporte High School, 13 DeWald High School. D, received financial reports for February 2024. E, received human resources report. F, approved 2024-2025 instructional materials allotment and TEAK certification. G, approved budget amendment. H, approved employment of professional staff. I, approved purchase of playground equipment for Bayshore, Lomax, Jenny Reed, and Heritage Elementary. J, approved term, probationary, and non-certified contract recommendations for certified teachers, admin, and professionals in pay scales, uh, pay grades one through five. K, authorize the superintendent to approve hiring of contract professionals of director level or below on the district's pay scale from April 10th, 2024 to September 1st, 2024. Pull. All right, we'll pull K. I'm shooting mosquitoes. Mr. Shoppy, can you read back the consent agenda? Yes, A, B, one, through two, one and two, C, one through 13, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Okay. Call for the vote. Sorry. Uh, yeah, need a motion. Yes, need a motion to accept the sign. Okay. Sorry. We're, sorry, I think we got distracted. I meant to pull H. Yeah. What? I meant to pull item H. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to pull H as well? Yeah. So we have an H and K pulled, correct? Yes. Okay. Do we have a motion by Martin? Do I have a second? A second. Second, Mr. Shoppy, call for the vote. Okay. All right, it's unanimous. Thank you, board. So we will go to H. Mr. Paris. Thank you. Yeah, so just basically, board, there's just uh, some uh, employment uh, opportunities here for some folks that. Once you decide to vote on that, I'd like to introduce public works. Okay? Yes, sir. Great. That's all I would like to share with that. Yeah, that's why I pulled it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Make yeah. a motion to approve item H. <laughs> all right, I need a second. Second. Second by Mr. Yonda. Call for the vote. Obviously, we don't rehearse. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, board. We and we will go to the final item K. Yeah, I just had a question on this. So, is this. If we weren't to approve this, which I'm not saying with that, you would have to go to the board and get approval, just, what right just what we're doing right now. So why do you want to do this? Because we're generally at this time of the year and in the Houston area under a hiring crunch. And so while we're waiting for a board meeting to happen, people that we have tentatively offered uh, positions to, they are being offered jobs by other people. So we lose really good people when we don't get an opportunity to do that at will. Um, this has been something that was afforded to uh, the superintendents prior to my coming here many years in advance. And so um, I was given this same privilege at the former districts I've worked because I think most, not everybody, but a lot of superintendents are given this by their boards just because we're, we're fighting for the same people. And okay? it's fast and furious then. And so. Any, anybody that we miss will go somewhere else yep. by the time we get ready to meet again. Any That's further it. questions, board? I seek a motion. Make a motion to approve item K. I'll second. second. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Thank you, a call for the vote. Yes, Dr. Jackson, please. So Board of Trustees and uh, guests, uh, it certainly is, uh, I'm proud to introduce to you uh, the new principal of LaPorte High School and thank you for that unanimous vote. Dr. Kate Griffin has served in his current role as the principal of Lomax. They don't really know who you are, Dr. Griffin, so would you please stand, sir? <laughs> 
<laughs> Dr. Griffin has served in his current role as principal of Lomax Junior High for the past six years. As an experienced educator, Dr. Griffin has held various roles in public education during his 19-year career, 11 of which have been right here in Laporte, and we thank you for your loyalty. Prior to his current role, he has also served as a teacher, football coach, instructional specialist, assistant principal, and associate principal at Laporte High School. Dr. Griffin was selected as the 2022-23 Laporte ISD Secondary Principal of the Year. Known for his collaborative approach, Dr. Griffin believes in fostering a positive school culture where all members of the community feel valued, supported, and empowered. He prioritizes open communication, transparency, and stakeholder engagement to build strong relationships and partnerships within the school and the broader community. Dr. Griffin holds a doctoral degree in educational leadership from the University of Houston. Go Cougs. All right. A master's degree in educational leadership from Sam Houston State University and a bachelor's degree in history from Abilene Christian University. Dr. Griffin states, I'm deeply honored and excited to take on the responsibility of leading LaPorte High School. And he's confident and committed to building upon the foundations set by Mr. Grammer to lead the campus to even greater levels of excellence that will make the students, parents, and staff, and community proud. Go Laporte Bulldogs. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Griffin. <laughs> Dr. Griffin, you can have a few words and I believe you have a guest. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you. It really means the world to me to know that I have the trust of this board to, to lead Laporte High School. Uh, it's truly uh, humbling to, to take on that responsibility. Uh, so I just really want to thank you again. It's really been a uh, highlight of my career sharing the last quarter of my life here in the board. Uh, it, it truly is home. Uh, I do have uh, my wife, uh, Stephanie, here with me. Uh, our son, TJ, is at my grandparents, but ever since he learned that this was going to be a possibility, he has been on me pretty hard to go see his first football baseball game. So we will be doing that in short order uh, here soon. So yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Griffin. So, board will return to item eight, our board officer's report. Uh, trustee continuing education hours report under state board of education rule. Complete and required continuing education each year of service is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member. Okay, we will we will go backwards again. Don't no, miss all that. It's okay. Uh, okay. Good, evening. Good evening again. <laughs> this January, the uh, district consults, consulted with Mr. Charlie Kennington of 5K Plus Services LLC to perform an internal audit of the Laporte ISD Transportation Department. Mr. Kennington spent several weeks in the district holding interviews with staff members, reviewing the day-to-day -day operations, analyzing the office functions and state compliance reports, and evaluating the district's routing and scheduling systems. Tonight, Mr. Kennington is here to provide the board with a brief overview of some of his findings during that review. But before I pass it over to Charlie, I do want to give a brief summary of his resume, which is highly impressive. Mr. Kennington has over 35 years of transportation experience. Uh, he started his career as a director of transportation at Gonzales ISD in 1986. He spent the next 12 years as the director of transportation at Gonzales, Waco, Robinson, and La Vega ISD before transitioning to become the state director for, for school bus transportation for the Texas Department of Public Safety. He served in that role for eight years and Charlie would later transition to become the director of school transportation for Region 4 Education Service Center, a role he would serve in for 10 years up to his retirement. Charlie is the gold standard when it comes to school transportation and we uh, absolutely were blessed to be able to spend some time and gather feedback from his expertise. So Charlie, if you could come up and uh, go over some of those findings with our board. Thank you. Dr. Jackson, I appreciate this opportunity to come to you and, and talk to you about uh, the transportation review that I conducted. I'll just kind of give you a uh, just a brief start. The things that you probably already know. You know, you're transporting approximately 2,400 students uh, per day. You have two campuses, you have 13 campuses, you're running 42 regular education routes, 
20 special needs routes, you're doing a three-tiered system, which means you have high school as a first tier, elementary as a second tier, junior high as your third tier. Uh, it's kind of important as we're doing some of the discussion when you talk about three tiers. So just kind of keep that in your, your mind as we get there. You travel more than 920,000 miles uh, annually, and you do it in a fleet of 79 school buses. Some of the systems that you use is Tyler Technologies, which is Versatrans routing and planning software. Um, Tyler Technologies Trip Tracker, which helps work through your um, trips that district campuses would take somewhere. It helps get it all approved and through the process. Uh, Versatrans Fleet Vision, which uh, will track your your fleet and the amount of money that's spent and all those types of things. Uh, you have video cameras on your buses and you have a smart tag system. So basically those are things that we were looking at. You have, I guess, uh, just for lack of terminology, you have two issues that, that you will be dealing with. One, you've dealt with this issue of a driver shortage yourselves for quite some time. This is not something that's new to you or new to other transportation departments. It is a shortage throughout the U.S. Uh, there are a number of things that causes that shortage, uh, but when you are short, what it does is it puts your office staff out driving, it puts your mechanics out driving instead of turning wrenches. That's going to cost you an overtime and other types of things. So you're spending money to cover the routes. There's just a better way to spend it if you can hire your drivers. Um, the problem that we see is, is there are no FTEs that are available for drivers. Uh, you're full, but yet you don't have enough drivers. And you've got to develop a process where your transportation department can work with HR and come up with a plan of how do you fix this so that when you're in the hiring process and the training process, you can actually get them going through the cycle but not count them against your FTEs until they get qualified to actually transport kids. You know, find a way to make it work, you know, but when you're saying I'm full, and then you look at your driver's license, because under the commercial driver's license, it's not fast. You used to, we could do this in you know, five days, seven days, we had somebody licensed and ready to go. We're looking at three months to four months, from the day you start them in a training cycle till the day they come out. And that's what's killing you on this, and it's not going to get better. This, the federal law changed that requires certain things to happen, and it has really bogged the system down for you. Um, one of the things that might help some, I don't know that it will help a whole lot, but it should help on the tag end, is when you get your drivers almost ready to go and you need them to get into DPS to take their final driving exam. When I retired in 2017, they wrote rules allowing uh, third-party testing. Third-party testing means that you could have someone on board that can do the testing and they get their license. You don't even have to have the appointment at DPS. So it's going to save some time down line. In the meantime, while you're trying to get that person or person set up and trained, because I would do more than one, somebody's always out or sick or something's going on, uh, you know, I would always have a backup for everything that I do. But, um, you know, just, you might even consider contracting. Talk to a, a number of districts around and find out who already has a third party tester. Sign a contract with that district, whoever it is, because when the rules were written, it allowed districts to work together to develop third party testers. Okay? So it is something that really needs to be developed. So driver shortages is is unless you fix FTEs and, and get where you can start hiring people and get them in the line, uh, 
you're going to stay shorter drivers. And that causes issues for you as your principals will attest to. You have late buses. You know, you know, it, it affects uh, the whole continuity out there for the parents. So just be aware that is part of that issue. Under routing and scheduling, one of the things that you could do to help alleviate driver shortages was take a look at your routes and see what you can do. If you've got a low ridership on a bus, say, let's, let's just pick a couple of elementaries because that's tier two, okay? So if I had a couple of elementaries that have low ridership and I can combine those two together, I don't eliminate the route itself. I only eliminate tier two. Then I can have tier one, which is high school, and let that be that longer route that goes out. It doesn't have a tier two. Then it goes to tier three and it gets there on time. Okay, so there's ways to, to do that. So you can get a temporary fix on it now and then in the summer take a more serious look at it and, and look at where this bus ends in the morning time and where it, it's, you know, it starts the next trip, you know, the next tier. And so those are ways that you can try to work that. Um, that would help get you through this, this process. School bus fleet, uh, <coughs> there's no real way to say this other than the first sentence up there. Your fleet is old. Your average age of your fleet is 14 years. Um, I refer to a, a graph on page 31 and 32, unless you've got your printout or the, the information that was sent to you with you, you won't be able to look at it. But when you get a chance, go back and look at it page 31 and 32 in the graph because I've done these kinds of reviews probably 300 districts over the last 20 years and one of the things that has always tracked true when you have an old fleet 14 years or older you have high maintenance cost to maintain that fleet and keep them running okay now when you look at that graph, because it has the information in there, yours isn't quite as bad as some of the others have been, okay? And I'll kind of allude to that in a moment, but just so that you have an idea. But it is still will track that history, and it has done that for over 20 years that, we, that I have watched. What Laporte has done at times is they've just parked buses. So I run out of budget, so I just pull a bus over and park it and don't do anything to it. So I'm not really spending money on it at this time, which is a potential of why your numbers still aren't reflected because you're not keeping that vehicle running. Uh, you're just pulling it over and parking it. Uh, so it, it can be part of the issue. But to look at your numbers in 21 through, uh, excuse me, 2001 through 2008, you purchased five to seven buses each year. That was very consistent throughout the time frame. In 2009 to 11, and then 14 in 2020, no buses were purchased. None. That takes those fleet ages and drives them through the roof in that category. So you, you need to be in some sort of a growth, or excuse me, in some sort of a replacement plan. Um, your transportation director has provided a plan. I reviewed the plan. The plan looks good. You know, I've come up with, a, you know, yes, you're a little heavier right now that you need to get you up on board, but at some stage, if you're doing this on a regular basis, five to seven looks like a fairly semi-reasonable number in there. And I'm talking replacement. So where I refer to that last line on there is, is for growth. If your district is growing and you're adding a bus every year, we have districts that say, well, we bought a new bus last year. We're good. We don't need to replace anything. Yeah, you added one for growth, but you didn't replace one. So you're still getting older. So you have to look at that full perspective in regards to it. Uh, 
overall, I want you to just know that you had a good review. I was real pleased with what I saw. Uh, you have a new transportation director. Uh, you have started the purchasing of buses. There is a purchase out there. You're waiting on buses right now to come in. Uh, so that's going to help you in that degree. The campus staff, when I visited around at, at the different campuses, you know, they seemed very happy with transportation. There were no major issues that just jumped off the board in front of me. When I talked to the staff you know, at the transportation, I had no major issues that jumped out. One of the things I like to point out, though, is under Transportation Code 521.022, which is a law that says a school bus driver has to have certain things. A Class B CDL with a P and an S endorsement. They have to have a physical, drug screen, all that type of stuff. As I mentioned, I've done about 300 of these reviews. I cannot count on more than you know, two hands how many have had a perfect score. And wave at them. You had a perfect score. Okay. <laughs> There were none. And I've been in districts that are already hurting for drivers and then say, this one, this one, and this one can't drive this afternoon. They're not legal. I can't allow them to go out. I did not have that at all. And I'm proud of that. That's Those are few and far between. I have always had at least one. And we've had one charter school that we were in that none of the drivers could go out none in the afternoon. Okay. Would that not be scary? <laughs> yeah. Um, when I talk to all the different individuals and I go into districts, one of the things that I see is is when I have a district that has old fleet and turnover of transportation director, which you have had a pretty soon significant amount of different directors running. Usually what I find in that category are staff that are frustrated, that are unsure, who are we even supposed to follow orders from, what do I do, um, along with fleets that are breaking down. You know, you know, the length of time I was here, there was one breakdown. One that was while I was here. That was to me remarkable because when you're having as old of a fleet as you have, your mechanics are all driving as much as they are, so they're not turning the wrench. We're usually having a lot of breakdowns in there, and y'all are not having them. Your transportation director, the when you have a turnover in drivers or in uh, directors, what you find is is that they just decide as a transportation driver that I'm just gonna you know it, this one's not gonna be here long, so I don't need to follow their directions. I'm just gonna go do what whoever I liked told me before. The staff were very complimentary of two people. Okay. Transportation staff were complimentary of two people. One is Brian Trousdale, which was, I don't know, 15 years ago. I mean, I know Brian personally, so it's, you know, I'm not surprised at that. But Brian Trousdale and Mrs. Rice. Okay. So they are pleased with where she's going. They were saluting the flag. You see them lining up and taking the steps that needs to go. Am I telling you everything's perfect? No. I'm not, but I'm telling you, they're watching, they're paying attention, they're moving the right direction, and what transportation needs is you guys to support them, pat them on the back, tell them they did a good job. And that brings us to this questions. Do you have any questions that I can feel for you? David? Yeah, um, did you get a chance to look at the programs the, um, that the Transportation Department uses? Because we've had, you know, I guess hearing that maybe some issues where 
different programs, computer systems doesn't speak to each other, and so there have been some conflicts or some discrepancies. Have you encountered any of that? Yes, and in the report you will see where that, that is detailed, and one of the things that I talk about is that you need to hold uh, Tyler Technologies as an example, hold their feet to the fire. You have a contract, you pay an annual fee. If they're not going to provide the service, then you need to make some decisions. And and there are some issues, and I, I don't know whether it's uh, uh, not 100%, but as to where all the issues are with that. But what I'm hearing is I believe Tyler Technologies is not stepping forward where they need to be. Um, it, now, I'm, I'm not sure as far as Tyler Technologies, is that the latest and greatest as far as the, those types of programs, or is there others out there? There are others out there. Uh, probably the one that is used the most in Texas, and I'm not sure about other places, but Texas would be uh, nothing like going blank in the middle of that. Uh, Trend Finder um, is uh, one of the outstanding ones that has been there the most. And as a former transportation director at Waco, I bought Trend Finder. I was the first director of transportation that bought Trend Finder in the state of Texas. Okay. So I liked it. Okay. <laughs> but I won't tell you the change. I'm telling you, you right, need right. To figure out what works for you. Um, the other question is, I know on your slide you mentioned about the routes and all that, and did you have access to the number of riders per r route or trip, and maybe had maybe made some recommendations on efficiency, because you're talking about, you know, there's a shortage of drivers, but maybe also, like you said, we could be busting one or two kids where we may not need to, we can move some people, personnel around. Did you get a chance to look at any of There was not a specific review by route. One, that would take a lot more time than we had for this. But the generic version of it says we looked at it and you have some numbers that can be improved. You know, and uh, in the report you will find some examples where I will say, and I'm, I'm quoting this off the top of my head, you had 466 467 riders at a campus. I don't remember the campus, but maybe that was, I, I don't remember. But you were doing it with 13 buses as an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you that, divide that out and say, okay, our average ridership is 20, 22. What if you change that average ridership up to 28? Now you're down to 10 buses instead. Mm -hmm. That's the way you can look at it, is look at it as a whole, and then figure out how to make the make it fit in this whole. I don't think you go in and, and just cut. And then even in the report, I will, I will warn you, don't cut routes just because you can cut trip one, trip two, trip three. Okay, a route is gone, now let's combine those together. The ones you're combining may not work. But what you are trying to do is make it where you can get the kids to school and home in a reasonable length of time. And by combining those and taking that tier two out or taking that tier three out, or maybe even a tier one, but most generally you're looking at two or three that you're gonna to have to, to do some removing from to get that help for the high school. That's a long version for a, a really a non-answer but you're correct I, I, not that depth okay and one last question um did you get a chance to observe how we handle i know because at times transportation gets very busy you know dismissal or you know early in the morning as far as handling parent concerns complaints or issues with the buses you get opportunity to take a look at that and are we handling those in a i in a timely, timely manner, efficient, and, and, and quick. You know, you know, they are working those you know, just as soon as they come in. Uh, even if a campus calls, uh, I mean, and even the campuses were very positive about you know the response back. You know, I don't get to just go talk to parents, so I don't. 
don't get to see if they actually did, mm -hmm. but I did observe them making calls and dealing with issues. I, I said his last question, but just one more thing. Sorry. No um, I'm, I'm sure I'll get to see your report and see what that, but of all your recommendations, where you think is the most important that you think we should make or adjustment that we should make that you believe probably is number one in your mind? Well, I covered actually two, two right here. There? Okay. You know, and, and to me, uh, driver shortage mm -hmm. is your number one issue. Right. Okay. Uh, you've got to find a way around that and, and solve it. And, and it's not going to be an easy fix. Um, you know, you're just going to have to buckle under. But I think there's got to be some way that you can say, here's a pool of 20, 30, whatever, that we're going to hire these people, but they're not in any kind of a position. You know, technically, you may be using them for other things just because that's the only way you're going to keep them on the, on the hook till you get them to becoming drivers. But leave those numbers alone and lock down your FTEs to what do I actually have to have. And you need to cover all your routes. You need to have an adequate number of subdrivers, my terminology, but subdrivers, so that when this driver is out sick, you can send somebody out. They know the routes. It's covered. It's mm -hmm. done. And you've got a list of sub, sub drivers over there that, that can handle any of those routes. And you got to come up with what is that magic number? Uh, and frankly, the, the best one to do that is sitting right back here. She, she has that, but I know it's going to take a jar. And I, I assume they'll have to come back to y'all and say, how do we deal with these numbers? Or here's a recommendation. How do we deal with these numbers to make it work? But and Dr. Jackson, are we are in communication with HR and how we can, as far as getting the talk and getting that process going? Well, we absolutely, but I wanted you to hear, yeah. and, and, and let me say to the board that we, Charlie and I, uh, he visited with me first with the presentation, and I said, I need to get you in front of the board in April. And so Dr. Bromley and I met with Charlie, and he gave me an overview. I have a copy of the report. It's 60 pages in length. And so we can either email it to you or print you a copy, but I wanted to make sure you just hear the overview first and then you can read it. And any other questions, we can bring him back or we can have conversations about that. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. If we can hire more people to help support this process, we can do that. I think he said several times that there is a shortage of that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not here to kind of give you a presentation, but we're not standing in the way of transportation being successful. HR or superintendent or the board for that matter. Correct. If and when they bring those recommendations to us, no one in this district is stopping and saying, you can't hire that person. Those people are just not that easy to find to do what he's recommending of us right now. Have you seen any other districts pay for their employees to get the their CDL? Do districts do that? Would that be an incentive to maybe yes. have someone become yes, a bus driver? And I, the districts that are not paying are paying the price because they are really struggling. Do we pay? Yes. We pay for the like we pay them to train, but as far as like saying shorter CDL, um, we don't do that. But I mean, we pay for the physical, we pay for the okay. state certification to be a bus driver. Okay. So what else is there? And, and that training which needs to be paid. I don't. I don't know that you have to pay for their life. Their actual CDL isn't you know, the big expense. I, mean, I just yeah. wasn't sure if we were the, paying for the training. But the problem is. If you interview somebody, you have to put them on some kind of a payroll because they interviewed because they need a job. They're looking for you know revenue that they can make for their family. And you have to pay them through that cycle and it has to be reasonable enough to hang on to them until okay. you know you got to dangle that carrot that says when you get certified, this is where you're going. So start paying well, them why they're going through the training program, yeah, so like the police academy or something. C when you're carrying that CDL and uh, you can't complete the deferred adjudication in your own car, you can't do any of that kind of stuff, that's kind of a deterrent for a lot of people that don't uh, uh. want to drive a bus and carry that CDL. Well, but if that's their job, then they don't really have a choice. It's not a, it's a, not a high-paying job and it's not a long-term job. Yeah. I mean, you're only 
I mean, we even have a hard time in our business getting it's people tough. to get CDLs yeah. because for that same reason. Not even CDLs. Yeah. 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 Part, of, part, of Charlie, part of part of what our issue is in, in this area. No excuses here <laughs> that I'm offering. We just happen to be, you know, two minutes from the Houston Ship Channel, and so people are paying double what we can pay yes. in a nonprofit mm -hmm. organization for a person with a CDL. Correct. And so. Again, that's not an so, excuse. So get one of the getting creative is right. the what? Right. You know, maybe they're bus drivers here, and maybe they do temporary school custodian at this one, or you know, some other whatever. I want to so they get the board forty first. hours. We'll, we'll be just, we'll be certainly exploring some of those other ways, but we're not stopping anyone. Yeah. That if, if they are certified and have all of the uh, credentials to drive. We're snatching them up. It's cool. Grab them up. So this last this last this year in the fall, we we put in a bus uh, trainee position, and that's what that's designed for. Some of that seeking CDL, we give them a ninety day window. They come in, we use them as a monitor during that time, so they help us. But they also get trained at our facility during that day. It's a brand new program that we've got. So we're starting to see the fruits of the labor. Um, so how many do we have? We've got well, we we basically we tag them right now to an FTE. So okay. if there's a vacant position and you want to come in, we tag you to that. So okay. that's some of the what he's saying don't do. But we've got to look at some of that. So it's there's a lot to it. The CDLs are tough, um, but I do feel very positive on what we built. We changed our entire operations and, and, and all of that this year. Yeah. Um, so I do feel like we will be in much better shape. Thank you. Just kidding. Can I have a couple quick questions before before I do that? Uh, I just want to say. Congratulations, Ms. Rice, and, and to the leadership team, because I, I think you guys are doing a phenomenal job in a short period of time. Uh, I, you know, with anything, you, you, I'm sure, inherited a lot of um, past issues and things like that. And I think the why, is to be clear on this, of why we hired Mr. Kennington, is we want to be able to help. We want to figure out if we can address where some areas of need. Um, and so, Mr. Kenning, I saw one of the things I saw in your report. It says we are uh, number of bus riders is low. So I'm curious to see if I did the math right. We're about 35, 34 percent of our student population that rides the bus. Correct. What would be, in your opinion, an acceptable number? And I guess my initial thought was we need to increase it. But really, is that a problem? Is it to me that mo more people, more problems? When I question the ridership, there were a couple of things. One, COVID came in, and it just bottom that and it's still not back to where it was if you look to pre-covid numbers as far as total ridership the thing that i always look at when i'm looking at whether i can boost my ridership for some reason okay typically what i would look at is the length of my routes how long does if i pick them up at and it's usually the afternoon, so I'll pick on the afternoon. You know, they, they get out of school at 3.15, but they don't get home till 4.15, 4.20. And we have those right here, okay? That's, parents will just say, I'm not going to do this. You know, so they will take off, go pick them up, so your ridership goes down. Or it gets sporadic. They may ride... Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever that the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever conflicted with. You know, there's there's different issues with with the whole piece. But you know, you really should work your ridership up. And after you look at it for this temporary fix for this school year, then take a really serious look at it during the summer. And then you might can actually eliminate a route or two in there, but I would still be very picky with it, assuming that based on my conversations, ridership goes up. Because if you start getting them home in a reasonable length of time, the ridership might go up, and then you find yourself having to add back in. So you want to be err on the caution side of that right now. <laughs> but percentage-wise, what like number-wise, what are you thinking is a, a target goal? For an elementary run, okay, I would say that if you can get to an average of 40 on a bus, you're probably doing good. There's going to be some areas where you're going to be close to 70. Let me define that for you. School buses are rated 
by the federal government for seating capacity. So when you buy a large school bus, typically you're buying a 71 passenger school bus, which is three elementary kids to a seat. You can't put three high schoolers side by side in those same ones. So it's not going to work. Typically, that same 71 passenger bus is going to run about 47, 48, which is two to a seat in order to handle them. So, but if you can get an average of 40 out of elementary, out of middle school, high school, typically, I would say that you're probably good if you're in the 30 range, maybe 30, I wouldn't even go to 35, I'd say 30, average. Appreciate that. I guess my, my follow-up question, my last question is more for Dr. Bromley. Um, Mr. Kenny, you mentioned when my colleague, uh, Mr. Yonda, uh, that you guys didn't have the opportunity to really reach out to parents, and I totally understand for the sake of time. But to me, that's a very integral piece of this. Like, if there's disconnect, you know, with the, the complaints we get always going to be from parents, right? right? And so I understand you guys spent your time with the staff, but what are we doing to uh, at least get some data sets from the parents? Like, how do we, because I mean, that has to be an integral part of this. If we're doing a true analysis. We need to figure out where the complaints at least from a parent perspective. Right. So part of the wrap up of him and him coming to you is we plan to send a survey out to just get some feedback as we move into the summer. Uh, and, and to mention even the systems, TransFinder versus Trans, we're even looking at that. Um, Smart Tag was our newest one. It's not a routing system, right? It's more of the badge end component. Um, so there's some upgrades with that. The app's coming out. So we're, we're going to look into all of that. Okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for coming out here and Thank talking you. to us. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate, appreciate you, sir. Appreciate Anybody else? No, sir. <laughs> All right. We will go back to item eight, board's officer report. Trustee continuing education hours report under state board of education rule, completing required training. Education each year of service is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member. I'm proud to report that all sitting trustees have completed their required topic one hours, orientation of legislative updates. Uh, topic one hours, evaluating and improving student outcomes. Topic two hours, board and superintendent team building. And topic three hours, board development. Board member Danny Hanks, 13.5 hours. Board member Russell Shoppy, 11 hours. Board member Jeff Martin, 19.5. Board member Melissa Crutcher, 10.5. Board member David Yonda, 16. Board member Mason Paris, 34. Board member Deanne Thompson, 53.25. This report is reflective of all recorded CE hours beginning April 4th, 2023 and ending April 3rd, 2024. So, that just has to go on record. There's no action taken on that item, correct? It's just a record. All right. So we will go to Mr. President. Yes. Can we take an item out of order? Yes, sir. With, with, with approval of the board, can we go ahead and take 12C? Since 12C. Yes. Yes. For being so patient. <laughs> yes. We will move. Thank you, Trustee Yonda. We'll go to item 12C and consider the notice of intent to apply for a license permit to sell alcohol beverage within a thousand feet of a school. Dr. Our petitioner has been here uh, since six o'clock and we appreciate the patience. Thank you. Yeah, we we we're taking 12C, like, sorry. Yes, help me out, I'm sorry. 12C. 12C. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this was put in front as, as, as what we've done in the past as, as regarding just uh, by way of the district. It's been history that it's a denial piece, but obviously we best you to, to make that choice on and we've been here before. Right? As yes. a we have. So this is near Rizzuto uh, Elementary. And we don't have any Rizzuto students crossing. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay. We're going to make a motion. We're good. We're, we, yeah. Any questions? Any comments? No. Make a motion. We approve item C. Consider notice to intent for apply for a license permit to sell alcoholic beverages within a thousand feet of a school. All right. I second that, but I, I would be clear. Like we're cause the recommendation is yeah, not, but we're voting to approve it. To approve. Correct. 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 So, do we need to amend that, or is it just, just, vote, just, just vote to approve? I'll second that. Okay. So we have a motion to approve. Call for the vote. All right. Motion is carried. Mr. Lunsford, you were 
Yeah. You can go home, Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> Stuck it out, bud. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> When we go to city council, we expect you to move our items up, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know what? We we have one other set of guests. We want to, yeah. Since we're on the issue, yes. we'll, we'll stay here in 12, and we will go to uh, item B of the same category, action and discussion items. Adopt a resolution number 2024-07, authorizing issuance of district's unlimited tax school building bonds subject to certain parameters. <laughs> to the board workshop, uh, this is the, the issuance of the yeah. second sell of the bond, the seventy million that we discussed. Board, any questions? No. Second. 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 Call for the vote. Folks, we appreciate your time too and your patience. We apologize it took so long to get to you. Who first and seconded that one, Danny? For the record. Yeah. One, two, two. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to stay in this category and just go to A and knock it out if everybody's okay with that. No, no I'd like to spin the wheel. Yeah. Spin we're the wheel. Go okay, we're going to, we're going to go to, tw <laughs> hey, we're very flexible these days, but we're going to do adopt a resolution number 2024-06 submitting a nomination for the 2024 Texas Association of School Board Superintendent of the Year. I'd like to look at the motion. Ms. Crutcher would a second by Mr. Shoppy. Call for the vote. And it is unanimous. Congrats, John. We took care of some stuff while you were gone. <laughs> Can we go with that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you for waiting. All right, we will go to our uh, item nine. <laughs> <laughs> item nine. Dr. Brown, yes, ma'am. Well, that's where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> so, re receive the 2023-2024 district annual reports, including the 2023-23 district academy uh, academic report uh, performance report. Okay. Good evening, President Hanks, members of the board, Superintendent Jackson. Everybody else, sit back on the line. <laughs> So this is our annual 2022-23 district annual report, which is the presentation as well as the public hearing. So um, as always, our district annual report consists of seven different sections. So if you look here, again, I wanna share with you, every information here has already been shared with you. So this is lagging information. This is data that we have shared, um, the academic data, as well as financial data. All of this has been shared with you this past year. So this is just a report to summarize everything so we can have a public hearing. And so section one is our taper report, which is our 2022-23, which is last year's data on our academic achievements, our district report, and our campus. Section two is our PEAMS financial report. Um, section three is our district accreditation. Four is campus performance objectives, which is our CIPs, DIPs. Five is our uh, reporting of any violent or criminal incidents on campuses. Six is performance in post-secondary. And also seven is progress towards our HB3 goals. So section one, this is our TAPER report, which is our Texas Academic Performance Report. This is done by looking at our PEAM snapshot, which is a culmination of our fall and our summer, and it's our student assessment data. And it is um, published PDF, and all of you received this uh, when it came out in December. So you had a copy, a whole pack on the TAPER report. Is a, an extensive report that goes through different areas of our academic side. So for 2023-2022-23, uh, as you all know, this past year there was not a accountability for districts. So that litigation is still pending. So none of the districts in the state of Texas has an accountability rating at this point. We are happy to um, also report though, our special education determination status is we meet all requirements for special ed. Our ethnicity report from 2022 to 23. Um, again, this is a comparison between the state and our district. So we notice African-American 6.7, Hispanic 54.2, white 34.6, and then the rest um, other races. And this is just a comparison. 
In terms of our enrollment by students, we have our EB at 60%. Again, as compared with the state, Section 504 students at 6.9. Our EBs at 12.3. Students with dyslexia 5.3 and at risk 44%. Instructional programs in our district, we have our bilingual ESL program at 12%. Uh, again, compared with the state, GT, gift and talent at 8.4, and our special education at 14%. I want you to notice our special ed education number compared to the state. So a little higher than the state average. So years of teacher experience, we have beginner teachers at about 6.7. Years 1 through 5 is 23, six, uh, years 6 through 10 is 23, years 11 through 20 is about 28%, uh, years 21 to 30 is 14%, and over 30, per, uh, 30 years is 4%. Attendance, chronic absenteeism, dropout, and graduation rates. If you notice our attendance, again, this is also lagging data. The district is at 90% compared to the state. Chronic absenteeism is at 33%. Your annual dropout, zero for seven through eight. For grades nine through 12 is at 1.3. Yeah, uh, yes, go ahead sir. and finish the slide now. I and then your four-year longitudinal graduation is at 90%. Why, um, okay, what defines chronic absenteeism? And two, why are we seven and a half percent above the state? Good question. Chronic absenteeism is 10 new, days or more. Yeah, it's a new indicator too, by the way. It's, and, and actually, if you notice, remember, this is 21, 22, mm -hmm. and this is doing the COVID. Now, if you recall, when we had students off on virtual, but then when Superintendent Jackson start, uh, began in the, so it was 2021, that in the spring, right? Jennifer? Fall. fall. In the fall. 2021 and then Dr. Jackson asked all students to return and so what we did is we had in-person um, schooling and so that alone is why we are at 33% compared to the district to compared to the state at 25% so you're saying not every, not all over the state did they come back right, right. 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 most students stayed home most districts decided to stay home for the we, whole we year. were they trying to make the best side of yes. that situation and right. bring them back but it hurt us a little bit right, right. and that's lagging data yes right okay so it will look better next year okay it, it'll COVID numbers will eventually just fade away oh, yes. from, from all of the right data. I guess right so. so here's our star performance all grades all subjects once again, you've received this data um, on your taper report in more detail, but this is just a um, graph in terms of the state, the district, and by our subpopulation. And again, it's by our approaches, our meets, and our master's numbers. And this is all subjects combined in all grades from three through ELC. The next slide is for ELA reading. Again, this is for approaches, meets, and masters, and it's state compared to the district compared to our subpopulations in grades three through ELC and, and am I correct uh, dr. Brown there are not many but some states and some some districts that are included in this data from the state that do not possess the populations many of the populations that we have to count against us yes definitely yes so what the, this is just a whole overview of every ethnicity every demographic that we have in the in the, our district here we have mathematics again it's from grades three through our algebra again the state come district and approaches meets and master's numbers our science if you look again compared to the state grades five eight and biology um, our subpopulations again. Social studies is U.S. history and eighth grade social studies. Our state, district, and our subpops. So the next section is our CCMR, which is our career and college readiness. So last month we had our coordinator come and, and share with you the, the great um, successes that we've had this year with CCMR. So again, this is lagging data. So the district was at 69.6% last year. 
we would say last year, but remember, this upcoming year, we've gained almost at 90%. So we want to see a big difference next year. Dr. Why is it, why, I understand lagging data, but why is this two years lagging? Well, no, I mean, I'm not too funny about it, but seriously, because like, always, that's not the every single yeah. time, but every, like next year we get this report, it's going to be for like 22, 23. Like we never have any real time data on where we stand on attendance or CTMR or any of that. Like, uh, we, we have real time data, but in terms of accountability in the state, this is, they look at the year prior. So even graduation, and they and look this at. This is our taper report that we just required by law and right. statute to kind of share. Right. We will be able to give you more yeah. real time data. Yeah, I love that. Like, yes. I think that yeah. the, the, you talk a lot about, I mean. Yes, right. this is just, we have to cover this by law to, to bring it before the board and have a hearing yeah. on this. But we will be able to give you some real time data on some things that happened this year in our May and June reports. Right. All right, that, that, that won't be part of the taper right now. It will eventually go into taper, but it will just be district data. So right. the logic of like the paper will barn you to read report for years old? The state has always yeah. done this. I, sadly, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but it's always been lagging data. Right. And it's hard to keep up when, mm -hmm. you know, you're saying you're working and they're still giving you something that you did two years ago right. or a year ago. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something on your TSI readiness and reading and math. Right. What is counting that 44.7%? The reason why I'm asking that is when I'm looking at the the taper report on page page 24. They're showing the district on TSI results graduates greater than or equal to criterion annual graduates um, for the 21-22 year for the district reading only at 5.2 percent, math at 5.9 percent, both subjects at 1.9 percent. So when we when they have TSIA that also includes SAT and ACT, so that's a combination of both, and uh, actually three things. So when you look at TSIA two readiness reading and math that also includes our SAT students and their scores mm -hmm. and our ACT. Okay, I, I want to come back to that topic, but I'll let you okay. finish. Go ahead. AP at 13, and so overall, all of these CCMR indicators add up to our 69.6%. But as we shared last month, this year, which is our 22, our 23, 24, we are looking at 90%. Okay, now we're moving to section two. Section two is our financial standard reports, and Stacy and her team has done an excellent job at continuing with the A rating for our superior achievement for our district in terms of our financial um, reports. Section three is accreditation. So every year uh, we are accredited in terms of all of the regulations and guidelines of each district in the state of Texas. So for 22-23, Laporte is Consider critical. Section four is our campus performance objectives. Those are our CIPs as well as our VIP, <coughs> our district improvement plan. Those are all online. It is posted publicly for all to see as well as their goals. And there is measures of performance at different quarters of goals for each campus. Section five is our report on violent or criminal incidents. And for 22-23 school year, Laporte has reported one violent crime incident. Dr. Mark, can I ask I a question on that? Well, mm -hmm. I'll go back to the, the, the year, uh, the lagging data. So on the CCMR, section two, it was 21-22 school year. Section three is 22-23, four and five are 22-23. So why are they not the same year on the different sections? That's a good question. So almost lag, the lagging data for most things are one year, but when it comes to attendance, CCMR, those things in graduation, you'll see that it's almost a two year. And I'll explain why graduation in a second, because they also count the year that the student graduates in the spring, but also they look at students if they go to college, and then they count that fall semester too as part of that year. Okay, thank you. Also on this, on this uh, report on section five, it says we're required to uh, provide a report on the rate and type of crime where would I find that report? We could, um, let me check and see, this is with FERPA, that we have to keep it private, but again, as board members, I'll check and see how we can get that. I'm just going to make sure, if, on its face That's value, fair. one sounds great, right? But like, I just, I go back to, well, I mean, I don't know, I just, I, how do you constitute a violent crime, I guess is what I'm getting at. There's 20 action codes that when you use those pertaining to discipline, that trigger state action, right? That require you to essentially, uphold an expulsion 
when you get to that type of level, you have to report that. So then maybe we can get the list on the campus. Say again. Sure. Maybe someone can the give us a list of the code. 20 yeah, actual codes. Correct. Yes. You want the code. Yeah. Gotcha. So if there's a felony arrest, that's not, that, does, that doesn't necessarily mean an expulsion, right? So that's what you're getting at on this? If it happened on campus, it does. Or within 300 feet or at an organ, you know, a sporting event, whatnot. Uh, yeah. So they can commit a felony and then it's on a school property, it doesn't count, and they don't come. Depending on what it is, it can. And we can take action. You just don't usually hold an expulsion, you can put them in DAP and move what is the alert system if the student was to commit a felony on off property and just does something random on vacation? They come back Police to school. Yeah, I mean, it, but is that is there a system that automatically alerts the PD that that happened and they're a student in our school, or is that just like, oh, we happen to know this? Well, that sounds scary. So if you get knocked out, like literally, this happened, or I know this happened, knocked out, put in the hospital, that's not going to sue a violent crime per this report. If charges were taken and it was an assault of a, of a certain level, it could. It just depends on what it happens legally. You know, Many times when those things happen, we go to the DA, well, the police officers will go, the SROs will go. But if they don't take it, then we're kind of forced to just deal with it. All these school district. are dictated by way of how the law enforcement piece mm. plays a role. Mm. Section six. So here's what I'm talking about. Um, I'll post secondary. If you notice, this is the section where it talks about our high school graduates. So if you notice, it says 21-22, because when you look at the second in the second bullet, so they are measuring any students once they graduate. They start looking to see if the student attended is going to military, is going to a two-year or a four-year university, but that also counts as the fall semester of that year that the student is attending. School. So if you notice here in Laporte, for example, you will see on the left hand side, four year public university, two year public college, and you'll see that there's 69, 120, 190 acre, two year public college. When you see not trackable or not found, and you see on the bottom, that just means that the standard ID number of those students were not found by the state of Texas. So they could not track those students. But this is where they get, and then they talk about what their GPA is for their first semester in college. So are some of those non-trackable numbers if they went to a private school? Right. Some percent. of these non-trackables are not found to be students who let, did, went to a college out of the state of Texas. Section 7 is our um, HB3 goals. So these are goals that track how our early childhood literacy and math proficiency plans are, as well as our CCMR. So if you notice, our goal for third grade that scores meets and masters was to increase from 53% in 2019 to 65% by June 2025. So with before June 2025, we had targeted years. So for 2023, the target was 61%. So if you notice here are the seven elementary campuses, the district overall was 57%. We were close to the target um, and by the schools, their target numbers. This also is seen in their CIP. The second board goal, and again, once again, let me just clarify, this is meets and masters only. So we're not looking at um, approaches. So goal two is our third grade math. Again, our goal was to increase to 50%. Um, from 50 percent to 65 percent by 2025 the target for 23 was 59 percent the district was at 49 percent and here's a breakdown by the seven elementary campuses and the third goal was ccmr was increased from 57 percent to 75 percent by august of 2025 so as you heard from Ms. marissa lopez last year we've already met that target so by 2023 we're at 90 percent because the goal here was by 2025, we're gonna be at 75%. This concludes the presentation. So now we will hold the public hearing. Yep. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I get the, about the approaches, meets, and master's level for STAR, but as I was looking at this tape report, what constitutes approaches, meets, and masters for SAT, AEC, ACT? Good question. Jennifer, she probably can answer that for you. <coughs> I could even 
Uh, actually, TEA works with the higher ed board and they look at like SAT and they say, for this score on the SAT, that equates to approaches. For this score on SAT, you know. So they've set those cut points. Okay. okay. Yeah. My other question is looking at this report, what concerns me is on the SAT, ACT, and I'll go to TSI in a minute. From, we went from from 22 to 23, 1% above the state to 17% below the state. From uh, meets 11% below the state to 27% below the state. And then we went from masters 12%, essentially at 12%, but we have 0% making masters while region four in the state were at 12 to 15%. That concerns me. The other thing that concerns me is the TSIA portion. If I go back to page 24, was um, uh, bear with me for a second. Um, on the reading, we were 9% below the state to 17.6% below the state. And then for math and TSI went 4.2% 4, 4 below state to 12.8%. So what's the significant drop off? What's happening on all those? Good question. So it goes back to what we have shared with you in terms of the approaches. So when we talk about the great approaches numbers that we have in the district, our focus is meets and masters. So if we're talking about from three to all the way up to ELC, we're talking about if students are at meets, they are at the place where they do not need intervention. But most of our numbers in Laporte is at approaches. So what we're working on is moving from approaches to look at meets and masters. Because when you're looking at SAT and TSI, those are all above level in terms of getting our students ready for SAT. And so we know we have a concern an issue with ensuring that our students once they get take the sat as an 11th grader some of our students are not where they need to be but uh, it starts with moving our students from approaches to meet some masters. and i get that but I, that's a significant drop just across the board from one year to the next so i know is it are we making sure everybody's participating and taking these tests are we not pre prepping them adequately enough adequately enough uh, to take these tests, um, I, I, I'm just that concerns me. Are that, you referring to STAR or, or no to TSIA, okay. TSIA and SAT, I, ACT? I heard both. Yeah. I think dual credit is going to play a role in yes. factor in that. Yes, uh, right, right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think I, I can speak to the fact that it, it, in years past, and that may be part of these numbers because again, sliding data. The only students we really had taking TSIA were those that were, were part of dual credit and they went to Sanjac, and so we had a very small student base. And now we are being and more those intentional. And numbers yeah. were pretty high yeah. because mm -hmm. it, was, it was so controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so now we're, yeah, now we're getting more intentional about looking at, okay, we, we know this group of students are not being successful on any other measure to show that they're ready for the next step. And so now we're being more intentional about prepping them, testing them. And so this year, the high school has just tested a couple, I want to say like, like five or 600 this spring, that we're trying to be more intentional about it. Do our and, students. And, and then, and then do, sorry. And then once we have that information and they've taken it the first time, we can see where are the gaps that we need to be working on and then give them the opportunity to take it again if they need to. Right. Do our students who are getting their associate's degrees at the same time, do they typically have to take the SATs if they get their associate's degrees? Do they have to take the SATs? And could that skew the numbers too if they weren't? They don't have to, but we we require all 11th graders to take the SAT. So let, we just had our SAT testing last week. But, but as a former high school principal, this is an age-old issue. Yeah. And Mr. Grandma might be able to agree with this, but this is an age-old issue. AP teachers, high-performing classrooms, when we control for the kids that we taught and that were generally, traditionally in those classes, SAT and ACT scores were, were there, mm -hmm. but there, were, there began to be a push to get more kids mm -hmm. to be open to the rigorous course, courses. Well, when you do that, it's, it's the general population for the most part that gets an opportunity to be exposed to that. But when that happens, Mr. Yonda, those numbers take a hit because now it's not just 
the kid that was the GT kid or the kid that was at the top 10% of every class. Now, I'm not saying that that's it in a nutshell, but it's certainly a part of that. Yeah. Is that exclusive of four eyes either? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When, we, when we trail the state, I guess that's what my concern is. Yeah. The problem with the state, and, and I hear you, and, and I'm not making an excuse, I'm just trying to answer it to the best of my ability. The problem when we say, why are we not with the state? Why are we less than the state? Why are, there are still a significant number of districts, not as significant as they were 20 years ago, that are affluent based schools. And so when the state says, here's what we look like, the state's not taking a thousand school districts that look like Laporte in Pasadena and in Goose right. Creek. The state is including some, some, some places High that skew some of that data. No, and I'm, right. I'm not saying that our kids, we don't have kids that can mm -hmm. compete to that level, but it does to some degree skew that data because here's a group of kids that are not exposed to or lack thereof some of the things that our kids are exposed to. In this district, we are beginning to just see more kids that have challenges and mm -hmm. that are coming with holes in their academics. And I'm not trying to say anything negative about that, but at the end of the day, we have to take the kids where they are and move them to where we want them to be. And it takes lots of time and it takes lots of coaching and lots of teaching. And it, it, honestly, um, uh, intentional things that we have to do right. to make that happen. That is correct. And, and we, we see the concerns we see where those pockets are, but again, it is a, it's not a one year because you've got an 11th grader coming in, but he, as a 10th grader, has missed a lot of learning. He is not going to make 1300 on the SAT. He's not going to make 1500 So those are things that, that's why when I talk about looking at approaches, meets, and masters, it really starts the foundational because students have to be ready by the time they're in third to be ready for fourth, fifth, and sixth because once they get to high school, it is not Mr. Grammar's fault and those teachers just to get kids as a ninth grader to be able to pass and by 11th grade take an SAT and make 1500. So that is a process that we're working on now to ensure that by the next three years, two years, we will see changes in our SAT numbers. And, and I'll say this just to add to that again, this is not an excuse. This is just us talking about the challenges that our teachers and our principals face every day on those campuses. I can look at third grade data and almost tell you what our 10th grade data is going to look like mm -hmm. if we don't do some significant right. remediation and some significant putting almost two people on every kid. And it's, 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 it's not impossible, but I mean, those are the challenges that a really solid teacher in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way through right. is having. I can look at third grade data and I do this every year and I can tell you if we don't do those things and almost triage those kids with with remediation and focused on tier one instruction and all of those kinds of things. We know what that data is going to look like when they get to the ninth grade. The research says that ninth grade algebra determines the, a, a child's uh, success in college. Well, we know that. We know that to be true as educators. But I'm telling you the research is even more clear about what happens with a third grader. Mm -hmm. If a third grader is not on, if the third grader is not at meets, okay, because approaches is not passing. Mm -hmm. Do we agree? That's true. If a third grader is at meets mm -hmm. or not at meets, we, we spend the, for the next seven years really trying yes. to get that child mm -hmm. together. And ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is America, Texas, Laporte, we're seeing more kids Principals, can y'all nod if y'all agree with that or not, right? We're seeing more kids in that bucket of, of, of that, that we work with than we are of, of kids that used to come from two-family homes and all of those things and they came to school already reading in, in kindergarten and all of those things. And so that's not an excuse. I'm just saying those are the realities that teachers in every classroom, principals in every building are struggling with and we are trying our absolute best we're bringing in some of the brightest minds and consultants and programming that we can to to accelerate that learning and to speed up that learning because we are trying to play catch up with a whole lot of children and so you've got my word and you've got my commitment and our commitment that we're working on that but we are still reeling from some of those things and i won't even say it's the pandemic that we dealt with these were issues that were happening already 
prior to the, am I correct, principles? Mm -hmm. Prior to the pandemic, they were already there. The pandemic just exacerbated that mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. And so, the, you know, that sounds so preachy, but, but Lord, this is where we are. And I promise you, every superintendent in districts that, that look similar to ours right now are having the same conversation because we're all in that, we're all having that issue mm -hmm. because we're having more kids that need tier one instruction, two teachers to each one of them, small group instruction, literacy development, phonics development, all of those things that we know help a child to be successful. But if we don't do it before they get to the fifth grade, we really, really, really spend the rest of their career trying to figure out how to make this happen. Well, I think I understand that a lot of this data is based on testing and some kids aren't testing. It's not a real reflection of how our students are learning. And so I, I take that into account. To Jeff's point, I understand your point as well that, you know, I think Jeff's saying we should never be below the state. And I think I kind of agree to, I, I agree to that. And, but I understand some of the data is skewed amongst the state. I did want to jump back one step to the behavior thing and the 20 points, whatever you're saying. Do we have our own set of guidelines and rules that go beyond, I'm not talking about if we have to report it to the state, that we say this is unacceptable beyond the state? And where would that be found? Our code of conduct? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all that's localized. There's mm -hmm. legislative components that we have to have in there. Right. Um, but outside of that, we have layers that allow us to do things locally. Okay, thanks. Do we have a benchmark? So I understand like that very valid argument I don't fully subscribe that it's completely based on income, you know, because I think everybody has to deal with that. But I think it's more resources. Some of these other, as you describe, more affluent districts, I think it's a, a matter of resources. They can, they do have the ability to put two people on each student, right? And I think there's tremendous value in that. And I know it's a money issue that we can't always do that. But do we benchmark, when we say these states that are well above the state level, do we ever figure out what it is they're doing better? I just don't assume it's because their kids are more fluent because they come from a two-family house, a parent house, whatever it is. Like, maybe that's part of it. But I'm willing to bet they're doing things in their districts. And so what are we doing to benchmark that? So I just want to, I think that we, sorry, when we had our meeting um, in February, I believe, they talked about some of the things that they're talking about adapting into our curriculum and stuff and adjusting things back if I'm not mistaken a lot of that had to do with things that we learned from other districts and their successes in these particular areas right right so we are as Dr. Jackson shared and, and Ms. Crutcher was saying we are going above and beyond on what the needs are um, what we're not going to do is keep on pouring pouring more and not look at what's happening in tier one instruction and the teaching so the most important piece right now is we're not going to continue to create staff if the tier one instruction with the first line teacher is not effective. So what we are pouring our um, abilities in is ensuring that our teachers have the right training, the right resources, and ensuring that in tier one, we are doing what's right for kids first. Then from there, we understand that we can do pull outs and our, our principals do a great job at having tutors, um, having, um, the ICs, our instructional coaches who are coming in and pushing in. But the first piece that we have focused on since um, the beginning of the school year on the pillars that I shared with you is that tier one instruction. We've got to get that right. Once we get that right, and our teachers are teaching their heart out. So we love our teachers and they're doing a great job. We've got challenges. Yes, we've got students who are coming in at different levels. You've got a class of 20 kids. Some of them high, medium, low, very low. So as a teacher, you're dealing with 21, 25 students at different levels. So what we do, what Julie does, and what our ICs does is look at the curriculum, ensure that what we're doing is providing our teachers the best that they can do in that tier one instruction. And then from there, we give the other support that goes along with it. But we've got to tighten that tier one. So instead of just going to approaches, we want our kids to be at meets and masters. So how are we basing if a say one school, are, are we looking at this report to say, okay, I'm not picking on Jenny Reed, but if say Jenny Reed has a reading specialist, but not a math, are we saying that, what, what data are we looking at to determine what, which interventionists they need 
rather than having both or is it a money thing what what's going on there it's it will never be a money thing money will not be an issue of providing the support that our students and teachers need even though we are in a bind we will ensure the resources are available to give our students what they need that is not the issue so we cannot say money is the problem okay. what it is is we know that every school every 12 campus has a different culture different demographics, different group of kids, and different clientele. So it really depends on what the, the school needs are. If Jenny Reed needs a math and reading instructional specialist, they will be there. If they need an instructional coach, they will be there. So it really depends. Every school is different. Every school has its own. And it's own. going to be based on your data. Right. Well, what and data are you looking data. at to determine that? Is it this? Well, report? it's not just okay. it's not just academics. We're looking at their culture. We're looking at their attendance. We're looking at their area. We're looking at the number of EBs, special ed. So we're looking at all various things. <laughs> yes, definitely. Right. right. And you have interim assessments yes. throughout the year. Right? Interim assessments. Yes. So the elementary school that says, okay, we need some help with reading, they would call you and, Ju you and Julie and, and y'all would find an interventionist to go over there with reading. Right. That's right. how that works. I, I, I really, real quick, the, I think a, a major point that we all need to consider is, again, the lagging data. I think that we have made a lot of changes. We've, we've, I know we've approved a lot of different resources. I've heard of a number of programs um, that have, have been implemented since this taper report or these, these assessments. And I think that we have to be patient. I know it's counterintuitive. We want to fix everything right now, but we've got to be realistic and understand that those things are going to have, those are long-term, right. you know, things. And, and right now, yes, it looks like, hey, this may not be where we want to be, but again, we have to be aware of the lagging indicator and this is we have thrown a lot of things at these these issues just in this course of this year yes. and I, I would hope that unless my my recollections off um, I, I really do feel like we have thrown a lot of resources and I've heard a lot of encouraging uh, systems and procedures and, and uh, programs that have been put out and I think we just have to wait to see that those sprout and I, I, I know it's frustrating and it's and we, we want that instant, but it's not going to happen. Well, I understand you're probably looking at the other data that we're it's not at the report. I, mean, I understand that, you know, we're not always looking at this report because you have the data from last year that you're going off of. Let me, let me go back to the, the... That's the final score of the game, that yeah. taper report. And so we have, you know, quarters that we're checking on each yeah. quarter, lots of data points at every, at every grade level, at every content that are guiding all the decisions that we make on a regular I mean, to get to the final score of the Super Bowl. I think we're just using this report to be able to talk about in a board meeting. Yeah, I understand that all this, not all of this is what right, we're talking right. about Let right me now. Bring this based back. My Let me bring this back around because where I start this conversation is when I looked at the SAT, ACT, and TSIA, they are measures, and we can discuss whether or not, who they're not, as far as are our kids, when we graduate them, are they going to be college ready? And when I'm looking at when they're 15 20 percent behind the state that concerns me and so that's why i brought that up and it's not like you know we're behind we're making pot it's like we dropped you know significantly all across the board and that and that concerns me you know we may be getting star but are we getting them college ready because star is not right. to me right and all due respect rigor. not every student will go to a university or attend a two-year university or college. So that is why with CCMR, you cool. also have the certifications for technical. So I say that not to say that- I know, but I, hope, I mean, hopefully a whole percentage because right. of that promise plan, San Jack at least, right. but you know. Right, yeah. and so I would say you are correct when it comes to, we still have work to do in terms of SAT, and we know that. We know that we have work to do with AP. We know that our students are not at three or higher. We know that is a concern too. Some of our students choose not even to take the end of the year AP court test. We understand that's a concern. Those are things that we're working on, but we also have to understand with CCMR, those other indicators are students have a choice, military, college, university, or technical. So I say that to say our CT program is another place that we have worked very hard on because we have students who they need a certification because they can go out and get a job. So they want a welding job. They don't want to go another two or four years of college. They want a job. And so that's the other thing we provide our students is what do they choose to do? Where do they want to go after college? And 
again, I would say yeah. that, yes, SAT is something we need to work on, but as Dr. Jackson shared, if you look across the board with the same demographics of students in districts compared to us, the average is about 970, 950 across the board for school districts similar to us. But that's not an excuse. Julie and I and our team and everyone knows we have work to do and we will continue to do that work so that five, two, three, four, five years from now, we will see a difference. One more thing I want to add with the college readiness, you know, we give the SAT um, mm -hmm. to our students as juniors and the TSIA. Um, some of the numbers that you're seeing the decrease is because we increased the number of students that we gave the TSIA to so that we could ensure that every senior had an assessment that was so and see, that, that's why I want to know I want what's the reason behind this drop that's, that's why I want to find sure. out because we're because right. before we would only take the TSIA if we if we knew we were going to take dual credit classes and that was our entry into into dual credit classes mm -hmm. so we know that TSIA is a measure that if, if a student isn't necessarily successful on SAT perhaps the TSIA might be a successful assessment so there's a bigger pool of students taking that assessment now but the other thing that we that we that is indicated in the CCMR that indicates college readiness is as seniors students have the ability to take a college prep course as a senior level either in English or math and we've partnered with Texas, Texas College Bridge for students to yeah. to to take that readiness and we have a great bit of success so students who you might not see test and be ready as juniors on the TSIA or the SAT are demonstrating readiness as seniors in that avenue too so mm -hmm. So keep in mind that those numbers that you're seeing are those juniors, and we, they just need another year to be ready. Right. Okay. I just, I got, the only thing I want to dispute is that you mentioned that money's not an issue. I got a text. I'll, I'll go into that. But apparently, there's this, like, you know, some campuses that say that maybe they need It's not coming from principals. So please don't misunderstand me. Um, but they said they have a math interventionist, but they can't afford a reading interventionist, right? So one of our jobs, I like, guess our primary job on this board is to approve budgets. And so I've asked you guys every year, like, please tell us how, how can we help? And I know that y'all are so respectful, y'all don't want to overstep, but there has to be some things. Like when I, my question on benchmarking, there has to be, if you just say Russell's ever staring me down, Deer Park is the best, you know, premium district around. <laughs> what are they doing? Like if, if they have an interventionist, like every campus for everything, like what are some things that they have that we don't have? There has to be something like that. And, and it I'll, has to be money related. And I will say this, the principles are out there. With all due respect, if somebody's asking and saying, we don't have this, why aren't they telling their principles? Because there they are. Because that's who, that's who I talk to when I say, what do you need for your campus? Now, I could go ask the teachers, but that's their job, just like you asked me to deal with my, my staff. So I'm saying, Jeff, and I'm saying to the board, there are the principals. Ask them if y'all want me to step out. Ask them and say, all Dr. Jackson said y'all can't have these things. I'm giving them what they tell me they need. And so for a staff member to tell a board member, we, they're not telling the truth, but here's what we need. I just want I want the principals to tell you all what they need. Well, maybe something they're not maybe they're just not telling the principals. I don't know well, what the issue is. But, I don't know why but all so seven like, and I can I can vouch for all seven elementary schools. We have a math and reading interventionist on all seven elementary schools. And some of that was is funded out of Esther. And I would say that Stacy and Dr. Jackson has worked to keep that to position. Make sure even with Esther going so away, that they have that well, intervention. Is there's nothing we can do financially on this board. No, 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 no. That's, that what what that's what I'm asking. Like, what can we do when this, we're already talking about budget? We've only talked about three months. What can we do in this upcoming budget? Because to your point, Dan, I get like there are some great things, but I don't think we've thrown enough money at this issue. We do. We talk a lot about buses and safety and stadiums which are very important but we don't spend enough time how can we get more resources to, to go above uh, and beyond the curriculum thing. like that is what i'm getting at because every time we get more reports about how we're behind the state level it's always justified well it's covid it's this that and the other the competitive side of me is like that it's not acceptable like what are we doing if we're not I, they're working their best and their hardest with what they have but why can't we get them more is what i'm saying I need them to talk to their principals so that their principals can come tell me what it is that they need. And I will be more than happy to bring those proposals to this board. Um, and I, I'm of the persuasion, and I just I'm going to be frank about it, I don't think throwing money at issues fixes the problem. No. I, I just don't. I, I think we have to be intentional about it. And I think the right systems and the right personnel and the right things, but it has to be intentional of who we put in place and what are we putting in place. Um, Julie has worked in, in, in several school districts uh, where we still draw from those places. 
Dr. Brown has worked in several school districts, so we still draw from that. And so, so many of our other people, this trader and this Jack, all of these people have worked in other places where we have connections and asking people, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Well, let's try this. Let's try this. So many of the things that we are trying are things that we are watching other people that have been successful at that. But it's not a magic wand, and I don't, I'm not saying this board thinks that, but it's not true turnaround leadership and true turnaround with scores and academics does not happen just because you put a program in place and you put another two people on top of it. It takes time. Some of these, some of these challenges that we have are systemic. Some of these challenges that we have, I hate to say it, but they're generational. And so we've got work to do uh, in, in this town, in this district, and how we approach really putting systems in place to ensure that our this that's what I'll say for that. I'll but, I'm sorry, but let's keep in mind also, we have six out of seven elementary campuses who was best of, of schools, right. yeah. elementary schools in U.S. World. News and World Report. Let's also keep in mind, two years ago before STAR 2.0, we have six campuses who were A-rated. So these camp, our, our principals and teachers are doing an awesome job uh, at what we have. Cool. And but I would also say with Star 2.0, remember when I shared that with you two years ago, that changed the dynamics of what testing looks like. And this past year, we've done a great job at showing improvement with Star 2.0. So it's only going to get better. I understand your concerns, and we're working on it every day. But we also have to keep in mind that we there's a lot of great. Our elementary schools are outperforming a lot of elementary schools across this area. Um, that's what Laporte, that's why we are HEB finalists. They wouldn't have chosen us if they didn't see the data that we're seeing. So I, I understand what you're saying and we'll continue working on it, but we are getting there. So. And I don't disagree with you on that, but what my concern is in elementary, we've been having that success translating to the secondary True. level and continuing to get the right. college that ready when they graduate because I, I, you know, looking at that taper report, going back since this is all about, and we haven't even had the public hearing yet, I don't think, have we? Yeah, so, um, you know, consistently above the state, but as we trickle to the right. second day, and this has been happening consistently, it's been a pattern. Right. So we would get to the high school, you know, and I'm not blaming the high school because it, it leads up to yes. that. It, it's a trend coming down. That when they graduate, we're not at the state when it comes to that indicator. And that concerns me because we can advertise all we want, mm -hmm. but if we can't say that that student walking out of that stadium is college ready, be able to be that, and even if they choose to go welding, whatever, but maybe later in life they want to go back to college, then say that I can rely on my Laporte education, I am college ready, I will be successful when I start taking that first course. That is to me the most important thing. And so, and, I, and David, I would, I would completely, I agree with you, but I also want to reiterate the point that was made. If you look at the third grade and the fifth grade and how high that those classes are performing, they are going to eventually get to the secondary level. If we've made the strides and improvement at the elementary level, it is going to translate at the secondary level at some point. We haven't got to that yet. And I think that we will start to see some of those dividends here as these kids that have been put through the programs and through the new systems that they will start to at the secondary level perform at the level that we're we all aspire them to perform at right. and I, I would hope that that's the case and if that's not then yeah we've got a major major reevaluation but i don't see that being the case yes i wish it was fixed today i wish this class but that's not our reality and right. we're we're dealing with y'all haven't been here you know for 12 years for these kids when they start in kindergarten. Yeah. I have to have faith that we're gonna start seeing some of those dividends at that level as these kids start to get to that level. And, and I agree with you. I, and I'm not blaming y'all, please don't. No, no, please. Because this is, this, right. this, is a, this is a pattern I've been seeing yeah. for over a decade now. Right. And, I, and so I don't blame y'all. <laughs> You're honestly inheriting you know, the patterns that have been uh, for many years. So I don't 
please don't misunderstand me. I'm blaming y'all at all. So I want to, my final comment is I don't want to seem like we're attacking you yeah. or either or the principals and teachers because I have more respect for uh, everything you do than anything else. But to Jeff's point, I don't think we would be doing our job if we didn't publicly ask. <laughs> could you use more resources? And I think that was Jeff's point, because if the parents at home think, you know, we just sent out a letter saying we're underfunded, you know, and so if we weren't asking, do you need an extra aide or an extra teacher? I think that it would look bad on us and it would look like we don't really care about you. So uh, that's, I would think that would like Jeff would ask and why I cared as well. Thank you. And we want we want to make that available. The one thing that nobody in this room can do is read minds. And, and if we don't know there's an issue, there, we can't offer a solution. <laughs> And again, there's these educators that will reach out because they may have a better relationship with one of us and they're, they're bypassing and that happens. That happens in every aspect of life. But I would appreciate and it if they would talk to us. I, I yes. would too. And I would urge anybody that's listening tonight, any of our educators, that they do so. Because we are willing to do whatever we need to do to get us this entire district to that level. We all have high aspirations, every one of us. And we want to see that that happens. So what, let us take that burden on and, and go out to the public and try to educate and, and beat the pavement and do what we need to do to try to get some of those extra funds. We just want, we are your biggest allies. We want to make sure you're successful. And I think that's been you know said several times tonight, but again, to that teacher that's listening and watching us online, please, Speak to your principal. There, there's nothing silly. If we can't do it, we can't do it. But we don't know. We can't. We definitely can't do it if we don't know about it. So that's my urge. God bless and, you for staying up. To, to oh, yeah, that's true too. Uh, and and one, one of the actions we've done that we share with you, the board workshop, is that advanced math. So remember, that is the change that we're making. Is we understand the concern with math in secondary. So we have our. We share with you the advanced math that we want to. And the has been a focus for us for exactly. years, which we kind of work on. And we've been working really hard behind the scenes in, in really aligning the assessments and the instruction in those sophomore level classes to the SAT and even bringing those SAT type questions down to seventh grade and eighth mm -hmm. grade so that our students are seeing a more rigorous experience when, when they're going through tier one instruction. So there is work to be done, but I think, thank you for your point about, it just does take a little bit of time, um, but we, we are mindful of what our neighbors are doing and, and we are always asking questions about how can we improve as we, as we get our checkpoint data or our final data, or, mm -hmm. you know, we, we want to do better for, as well. Well, we appreciate your passion and board. I appreciate your conviction also and all your points made uh, that needed to be said. So thank you very much. With that said, we will open the uh, public hearing at 934. Is there anybody that wishes to make comment? Going once, going twice. All right. This hearing is closed at 934. All right. Uh, we will move on to... What item we have left? Do we have any left? <laughs> we have item 14. No, I'm sorry, 13, huh? Item on, on closed item, closed session items. We don't have anything, so we can mark that one off. We'll go to 14. Closing comments by the Board of Trustees and Superintendent. Uh, I'll be brief. I know you've been here all night. I want to thank Candace for jumping through all of our agenda items with us. I'm sure that I can't wait to look at those minutes to see. <laughs> I'm sure she has a whole legal pad filled out of this. So. Thank you to that. I also want to thank the Lemonade Day uh, committee who put that on, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Terry Cook, Frank Nance State Farm, and Garden of Eden. Y'all did a great job on that. And a uh, round of applause for that. <laughs> Two more things. Partners in Education is done a great job, so thank you, Terry, for all that. We love seeing these um, events here. The FFA students are showing their animals this week. Sometimes we forget about them. They're not under a Friday night lights, and they have one week a year that they really they get to shine. And so. Uh, they've been doing that all week, and the auction is Thursday. I'm sure a lot of our administration will be there, so they always appreciate that. Mr. Grammer, thank you very much for everything you've done for LaPorte High School, and uh, you did a great job. And Dr. Griffin, we're looking forward to working with you. I'm done. Um, so thank you for mentioning FFA. They were one of my shout-outs as well. Um, I just want to also mention that uh, since mid-February, we've had... Um, our young ladies who are freshmen through seniors preparing for the Miss Sylvan Beach pageant. It's scholarship opportunities for them on the junior senior level. Um, it really helps build their public speaking and interview skills, which they will use throughout their lives. So uh, please just if you happen
happen to see any of, their, any of the contestants, wish them luck, but also support them by coming out and seeing them um, on April 26th at the San Angelo Theater. Um, and uh, also, I just wanted to say good luck to the high school starting their star testing on Thursday, um, as well as all the students who are going to be testing in the weeks to come. Um, guardians, please make sure that you set them up for success by giving them a great breakfast and big hugs before they go off. So that's all I have to say. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I know it's star testing week and uh, I know the stress of all that going on. I wish y'all each and your students a, a well success and I uh, know the hard work of teachers all year long um, to get them ready um, uh, will pay off and uh, wanted to wish y'all a, a great night, get some rest and, um, and that's all. I just want to echo what Mason said, and Mr. Grammer, uh, again, I said this, I got, I got in trouble because I got some preliminary last meeting, but uh, we, we sincerely appreciate the job you've done, and, and a phenomenal person, and uh, we wish you certainly all the best, and whatever uh, life may bring your way going forward, and, and certainly, uh, Dr. Griffin, congratulations mm -hmm. uh, on your new role, and God bless you for uh, taking on that challenge, mm -hmm. and, um, but we're excited uh, what that will, will happen, so uh, again, again, I apologize, I know I get passionate, but it's because, like, I don't know if it's because I'm from here or we spent so much time with just all the things going on in this district. We want, we know that we have a phenomenal district. We have amazing employees, students, but we also know that there's ways to improve like everywhere. There's always every single day a way to improve something. And so I get passionate about it. I get so frustrated about hearing all the shortfalls of budget and that's all that stuff out of our heart. We can't fix that. It just kills me. And so I know that we can't just have a magic wand and fund everything, but I know there's things that we can do. And uh, I don't want the teachers to be discouraged. Like we, we love it. Uh, well, it can be overwhelming, but we love that they feel comfortable. I, maybe it's because we're elected. I don't know. Uh, but please continue to bring us the stuff. We'll, we'll pass it to the appropriate channels. Uh, but again, we're just we're fighting for every person on this board. I love them to death because they, they are, have a heart for service uh, and helping this district, right? And so again, I know I can come across as harsh sometimes, and I don't mean that to be the, the case. The last thing I want to say uh, on a personal note, I just want to give my sincerest condolences to uh, Alma Pittman. She's the uh, librarian at uh, Bayshore Elementary. She's got a, uh, a very, very special daughter that passed away last week. And uh, she's a dear friend of mine. And so just please keep Alma and uh, her family in your prayers. Um, yeah, share the sentiment with uh, Ms. Lundquist, obviously, in her passing. I know Melissa uh, alluded to that moments ago or at the beginning of this, whatever day that was. <laughs> um, but uh, she made an impact on a lot of people as well. Uh, yes, I, I really appreciate the, the passion and the conviction, uh, everybody tonight. And, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of good things going. Yes, there's always room for improvement, but I, I do want to celebrate the victories. And uh, there's certainly a lot to celebrate each and every day. We show up and, and uh, get these kids in and out of these schools and, and make them one percent better you know that's that's the key so uh good luck on our testing thank you for all of you that participated do you have anything dr jackson i'd just like to say thank you to the board for your confidence in me and uh and, and my team and our team and that includes principals teachers and everyone but i also want to say and i think i want to say this to the microphone <laughs> as we as we hear about all the challenges that people are going through and districts are going through this board directed me and uh, and we all agree that we're going to take care of our staff and uh, I know districts all over the region right now that are having to do some really 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 tough things and um, we, we're not having to do that our staff is put in place and uh, I, th I mean ESSER funds are going away but our people are remaining where they are and so I think you already board are doing some phenomenal things by being able to commit to that and hold me to the fire for that not that I was going to do any different than that but to hold me to that but uh, you have my commitment that I and our team uh, in our entire district team we're committed to doing all of the work that we're doing right now and to grow in this school district so I do appreciate your vote of confidence and I certainly hope that we continue to hold on to the vote of confidence of all of the people that we work with uh, leadership is service. Leadership is not uh, mastery. Leadership is service. And so that's our job is to serve. And that's what we're going to continue to do. Here, here. And uh, we appreciate the long night. I know it's uh, everybody be careful getting home in this weather. And our meeting is adjourned at 941. <laughs>